project management crew today we're going to be taking on project quality management i'm going to warn you this is a substantial topic so we're going to be moving very quickly today some of the concepts we're hitting on are more thoroughly described in your text so remember to read the chapters as well the purpose of these presentations is to give you a superficial view into the greater depth of what I think is a high quality text. So we're going to be talking about quality management. Speaking of quality, in other words, are the results of our project living up to the standards for which we have set for the final product? So what are our objectives? Our objectives for this chapter are to talk about why quality, important, quality management is important and what the various aspects of it are. How, how do we manage quality and what are the outputs of quality control? We think about quality, guys. We think about how many defects are in a product or service. One of the common problems with IT projects is sometimes the quality is not there. Anybody who's had to install a system patch on a phone or a laptop operating system can attest to the fact that these are not fun things to deal with. We're also going to talk about some of the ways in which we can monitor quality. We'll, we're going to be talking a little bit about things like Six Sigma today. Do keep in mind these kinds of quality standards, uh, Six Sigma and, and groups like ISO, for example, ISO 9000. Those in-depth explorations are beyond the scope of this class, so we'll be mentioning them. But I'm going to encourage you to explore them more on your own. We're also going to be talking about how uh, quality has costs associated both on the aspect of ensuring higher quality or the cost of not ensuring quality in IT projects or otherwise. We're also going to be talking about how we can use software to, uh, to guarantee or at least to measure quality and also the considerations for agile environments. So it's, it's an old joke that the difference between quality management in IT uh, and other disciplines can be compared to windows versus cars. The old joke is that the Windows engineer uh, and the GM, the General Motors engineer, are traveling together. And when the car breaks down, the uh, Windows engineer gets out, rolls all the windows down, and rolls them back up and expects the car to restart. Terrible joke and told very poorly by this instructor. But the bottom line is if we expected uh, the same amount of defects from our cars that we accept from our computer operating systems, we'd be stopping quite a few times to restart our cars alongside the road. The kind of uh, poignancy to that joke, however, is that right now with further integration of computers into things like cars and, and daily appliances, we're seeing an era now where we might actually have to start installing system patches in our cars. Anybody who's gotten a recall for engine software can, can attest to that, and even our televisions and other devices, which normally would not have been dependent on the same things. So in terms of other things that can go wrong, these are some wonderful examples of how quality uh, can cause problems in the real world, occasionally even fatal problems, whether we're looking at the idea of, uh, of technology failing in the space shuttle, Facebook having a data break, or even folks uh, such as Equifax having a hack because they did not install system patches. Those are minor compared to people actually getting uh, fatal doses of radiation from automated machines in hospitals. So quality can have a human cost as well, it's something we need to consider. So in terms of, of how we define project quality, quality management, the International Organizations for Standardization, we generically refer to as ISO. Whether they have standards like ISO 9000, they basically say that we need to monitor uh, quality and quality management uh, means that how well can we satisfy what we said we were going to do. Some other people define the idea of quality as whether or not we lived up to specifications or is something actually fit to use. If you work for the USDA, for example, and you're examining uh, meat or, or plant products, are they measuring up to the standard where they are fit for human consumption? For example, we have grade A eggs versus grade A large eggs. They measure up to different means of comparison. So what we really want to make sure is if we're undertaking quality management, that whatever we said we were going to do, what we said our project would accomplish, that it does so at a level where it is acceptable to the customer. So we plan to know which standards we want to live up to. We manage the process of producing the product or deliverable so that we can, we can make sure that quality is, is baked into all steps of the process. And by controlling it, we basically are measuring the end products to say, uh, did, did our end products measure up to that standard or do we need to change a part of our process? 
Here's a great example of, of what areas fall under project quality management. We've got planning, uh, managing, and controlling. You see the inputs uh, right from the get-go, our project charter and our project management plan, our project management plan, which is an input to all of these areas. And again, the, the, uh, the tools and techniques all, for the most part, involve gathering information and data. And we're putting out outputs from all of these areas. The outputs are going to be methods of measurement, maybe even changes to what we're looking for for deliverables or our project management plan unto itself. Particularly if we find out a method of managing quality was not working in the first place. We were not accurately able to determine what it was we were supposed to produce. So we're planning uh, this particular area. We're planning project quality management. We want to make sure that we are are picking the right materials to measure, that we're training people how to measure, and that we have a process that is accurate. So for example, if we had a production line, we wanted to train people to recognize defects in bottles of beer. They'd need to know what kind of bubbles they were looking for and to be trained in how to, uh, to, to measure those bubbles in the bottles of beer, for example. So what about the scope aspect? Guys, we, we think about scope. What is scope? Scope is the total size of a project. So if we're getting too uh, granular in terms of our quality management, although we like to think that we're keeping, keeping quality standards high, ultimately the scope of the project can get very, very big very quickly. It could be bigger than we thought we wanted to, uh, to have in scope, in scope. So in other words, the more you measure, the more time it takes to accomplish a project. So what are some of the scope aspects? Well, the functionality. Is the system actually doing what we said it would do? Do we have all the right features? For example, if we're creating a new user interface, do the screens look like the end user wanted them? That also gets into systems analysis and design, user requirements. Uh, the system outputs, do, uh, do, do the reports or, or outputs of the system, for example, if we, if we create a, uh, an interface for one of those new amazing uh, touchscreen soda machines, is it actually blending the soda correctly? Uh, the reliability of the product. Is it doing what it's supposed to do all the time? Are our iPhones completing calls? Uh, maintainability. Uh, can a consumer maintain the product? In other words, have we created something that's going to require constant maintenance, or is it something that's ready for the general pro uh, population? So all the folks who are involved in, in, in the project, all the stakeholders, ultimately are going to be playing into how big of a scope of, of quality management we have and how much time it's going to add to the project in general. So in terms of quality assurance, that, that means basically that we are going back to the, the standards that we set and, and living up to them. Now, we need to be very clear here. Not every product is meant to be produced at the same quality. For example, if we are buying uh, eggs, there are, there are more than grade A size large eggs. There are other grades of eggs as well, smaller ones, for example, ones that maybe are not as high, higher quality. If they still measure up to the right standard, that's fine. There's a reason, for example, why a BMW costs more than a Chevrolet. BMWs are engineered to more stringent quality standards than Chevrolets. That doesn't mean a Chevy is not a, a perfectly fine and safe car to drive. It means that the gap between the hood and the side of the vehicle might be larger or less consistent from one vehicle to the next than a BMW, because higher quality standards generally mean higher cost. And again, uh, if you get into uh, things like uh, Japanese, for example, you use the, uh, the term for continuous improvement, it's called uh, Kaizen. Uh, some of the other ideas are that we can benchmark the quality of our products against other products on the market. If you want to know, for example, in advertisements, why would, would Chevrolet or Buick be comparing their quality to that of Japanese automakers? Because Japanese cars are typically associated with very high quality goods uh, and we want to be able to say we're living up to those. And if you're doing a, a cost comparison, we're measuring up to the same quality of Japanese cars at a lower cost, for example. That might be a sales pitch. And a quality uh, audit means you're going through and, and checking your processes and how well they're actually working. So how well did our, our quality management processes work? So when we build the next car that we don't make the same mistakes, or if we did a great job that we maintain that level of audit. So Kanban, which again we talked about as a, a potential uh, pro project management methodology from a quality standpoint, means that we, we visualize processes and that we walk through uh, the entire process so that if we are, for example, in a production line, that we can see where there is a gap in quality, where the change takes place. Again, a very Japanese concept. 
Then we get into con controlling quality. And, and the main outputs here are that we make this decisions about what is acceptable. Uh, for example, how many defects are we allowed to have? What variants and, and, and products are being produced is acceptable? Uh, what level of rework is acceptable? And, and if there's a change, uh, how do we change the, the pr process? Uh, how do we adjust the way we're producing things? So we, we've got a lot to talk about here. So we're going to move very quickly because, again, our text, I think, does a great job in describing many of these tools. But we've got tools to be able to help us determine uh, where we're, we're losing quality or, or maintaining it, how a process for producing a product or service works, uh, how can we ver verify that what we are intending to produce is, in fact, getting produced. We start off with cause and effect diagrams. So we start off when we're, we're uh, assessing problems in a system, we can break it down one step at a time. For example, we've got a uh, problem with user access here. Is it system? Is it hardware? Is it the user's hardware? These kinds of processes often you may see uh, and be very familiar with this idea. They're used to, to create what we also refer to as process for tech support and troubleshooting as well. Makes sense. People who have seen these kinds of issues before will know how to put together a diagram to talk someone through a problem. Uh, we may even have uh, upper and lower limits. For example, it may be acceptable uh, for us to have a, uh, a latency on a network card of, let's say, plus to three, uh, plus to, to minus three milliseconds delay. What's the upper and lower limit that is still acceptable in, in maintaining quality? If we drop beneath those layers of latency or above, or if we go above those layers of latency, for example, in a network, we may see slow access to the internet or a system. And the same with, with tolerances. If we want to make sure, for example, that a particular piece of steel has a certain amount of tension, uh, or can stand up to a certain amount of weight, what are the upper and lower weight bearing limits uh, of that piece of steel's ability to bend? Uh, what about just tracking how many complaints we got per day? For example, if, if our limit is we want to make sure that we have no more than three dissatisfied customers a day, we track those on a daily basis. So again, quality can go into non-technical aspects as well. Then we also get into what we refer to as scatter diagrams. So if, if, for example, the user satisfaction rating, Every one of us, anytime we do any kind of customer service at this point, we get asked to, to score the service. If you're scoring your customer service representatives on a one to five scale, at the end of the day, we want to see that, for example, that, that everybody's giving us fives. Well, it's also interesting to, to be able to compare that by other variables as well. This particular chart is comparing user satisfaction to age. Well, if we are producing products, for example, for people of a certain age, uh, for people over the age of 50, this chart basically says that uh, people 30 and up, X number of people rated us at, at a score of 5 or a score of 4 or above. That's a great way to determine the quality of your service. And histograms, for example, are just another way to be able to represent data. For example, how many complaints do we get per week? That's a great way to determine over time if we are satisfying quality requirements, if we have work to do, are, are our amount of complaints going up or down? Now, this is a teaching moment here. Just because the amount of complaints is going down doesn't mean your quality is going up. There could be other variables as well. For example, if we had a week uh, during Christmas, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, we got next to no complaints, but our service satisfies mainly business needs, could be that there are more people out of the office during that time too, meaning simply as, as many people weren't calling in because nobody was using our service. And again, in terms of uh, another Pareto chart, we could also uh, be able to co compare the number of complaints in a given week uh, with the total number of complaints based on the type of complaints. How granular do you want to be? This particular Pareto chart was, uh, was saying by a breakdown of 100% of the complaints, what percentage of them were coming from specific sub areas. Flow charts, for example, and again, these are very useful for, for call centers and tech support. Uh, that we were able to determine at what point do we route off most of the calls. For example, if you're working for a help desk and the first step is to instruct people to reboot their computers and very few calls get past that step because it fixes the problem, you have a pretty good idea of where your, your system problem is. That's a, a very simple example. And again, we also might want to see in different what we refer to as run charts. If we are looking at multiple defects, do they cross over? This could mean those defects are related. 
For example, if we're having a, a problem with hardware and software, when tracking the issues with both of them, we may be able to see that we've got uh, some concurrent problems that are potentially causing each other. Then we get into what we refer to as statistical sampling. We're using a smaller part of an overall population to hopefully give us uh, some sort of representation. Why do we do this? Because it's impossible to sample most times an entire population uh, if we have anything beyond an immediate sample or immediate, uh, immediate user group. So if you're trying to determine users nationwide or statewide, for example, you might want to use some level of statistical sampling. So if, uh, for example, if we want to have a certainty of 95%, uh, our certainty factor breaks down to 1.9% error for error. So we can have a certainty factor of 1.9. 1, 1 that means that we're going to have 95% certainty of no defects. So if we sampled people at that level. Then we get into Six Sigma. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Six Sigma other than to say it's a very popular business-centric method of ensuring quality and, and it's something we measure by belts somebody who is more versed in quality for example could be a green belt or a red belt uh, and it's a way to align strategic processes with quality uh, and a similar uh, metric uh, as part of uh, six sigma we've got the acronym demake define define the problem measure uh, determine what it is you're measuring analyze where the problems might lie where the de defects might may come from improve the process or product, and control and make sure that you are, on a regular basis, uh, reassessing. So we have what we refer to as a, as a belt system. And when you go Six Sigma, it means everybody in your uh, organization is committed to continuous quality improvement. Again, focus on the customer and the product and improvement at all levels. So what makes something a potential Six Sigma project? It means th that you are you've got a quality problem or the, the things are not working the way they should. Six Sigma is also good for analyzing abstract or large pro problems. If, if you know what, what the problem is, if it's a simple problem to fix, Six Sigma is not your methodology. So Sigma is another term for what we refer to as standard deviation. And what the, the bottom line, we'll show you in the math shortly, means that if you're in Six Sigma manufacturing, for example, you want to have no more than 3.4 defects uh, per, per million opportunities. So for every million packets that pass through your server, only 3.4 could be lost per, per million packets if you're talking about computer networking. So what are some, uh, some key terms here? Yield is the number of units handled correctly through the process, and a defect is anytime something doesn't work correctly. And so you've got you've seen what we're looking for and six nines of quality is a measure of quality control equal to one fault per six million and that's where we get the the idea of we're going to have 99.999 percent service and in terms of things like bandwidth you're looking at 30 seconds downtime a year it's a high standard folks where does that come from again the normal curve means within anything that uh, about 68 uh, percent of your population falls within one standard deviation from from the norm again we're, we're talking about standard deviation here again statistics uh, that you've probably had in your basic stats class if we get into six sigma uh, that's where we're getting to the 99.7 percent and here's where that comes from six sigmas away means we've got uh, we've got 99.9999 blah 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 uh, away from uh, from total quality so two two defects per unit that puts us roughly within six standard deviations of the mean that's where the term comes from so if you want to know where six sigma comes comes within is that we've got no more than two defective units within six de standard deviations from the mean of all the processes that could happen and that gets us down to 3.4 defects per million opportunities and again not going to do the math for you the, the text does a pretty good job of doing that so let's get into testing One of the legacy perspectives we're testing is, is that it was something that you, you did before you turned something over. Well, we developed the product. We better test to make sure it works. In reality, uh, whether you're doing IT or, uh, projects or projects of any kind, you're going to be testing throughout the life cycle of your product or project to be able to determine if things are measuring up to the standards you have set. So it's something that has, has to happen all the time. 
So here's a great example of a, uh, of a, a testing task, and I'm, I won't read this all for you, but you can see that, that there are many points whenever you, you are doing different types of tests throughout. Uh, for example, in the development phase, uh, once you get past the unit test, then you're getting into inter integration tests, system tests, user acceptance tests, and, and all kinds of tests, so that along the way we're making sure that, that not only internally, but externally, that this product or service works. We want to make sure the customer is happy with it as well. So what types of tests do we have? Well, if you're building a, a piece of software or a piece of hardware, or if you're managing a project in general, you might want to test each component to make sure each component is good. For example, if we're making a car, we're going to test the wheels. We're going to test the axles. We're going to test the engine. Integration means how well does everything uh, work together. So we're going to take maybe individual small, smaller uh, groupings, might test the different components of the transaction or the, the transmission and axle working together. Well, finally, system testing means we'll put the whole darn car together and test it together and see how safe it is and how well it works. If you've ever been in a situation where the car engine revved well, but the transmission didn't seem to translate the power, the, the, the system testing uh, showed that, that maybe integration was not as good as what we hoped. And user acceptance testing means that somebody in a position to sign off is saying, yes, this product satisfies the need for which it was created. So, and again, in terms of, t of testing alone is great, uh, but you also should be, uh, should be looking at, at other kinds of defect detection as well. Here's, here's a great example. Uh, Apple recently had a problem where, where we determined, or an end user who was 14 determined, I should say, that the, uh, the online video uh, messaging program, FaceTime, was allowing people to call into other people's phones without even being detected. And it never showed up in unit testing. It never showed up in, in software system testing. It only could be produced under very specific circumstances. And what that means is that testing in a laboratory is not, not itself alone or enough. That the individual components also have to be uh, guaranteed for quality as well. So in terms of modern quality management, we've got to keep the customer happy. Uh, we want to prevent products from being defective from the from the use of good quality uh, components in the first place, but we've also got to go back and inspect. And we also uh, have ways to uh, to recognize well done projects. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this either because we're talking about management philosophy here to some extent. Uh, groups, uh, individuals like Deming and Isakawa, for example. So. Again, these are a lot of the history of, of quality, uh, and you, you, you always can hear about Deming or the Malcolm ba Baldridge Quality Award. The bottom line is that, that a lot of, of business authors over the years have talked about how we, we have total quality management, how we delight the customer. If you want to talk about people like Tom Peters uh, or Peter Drucker even, uh, these are, are ways that we can recognize quality in industry. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this either. ISO is a popular uh, thing to talk about these days because companies always want to be ISO certified, International Standards Organization. It means you've got, you're adhering to a process of, uh, of uh, planning, controlling, and documenting quality, a secular process, really, that, that is very uh, part and parcel with what we're talking about with the PMI standards as well. And it helps to make sure that the customer ultimately is getting what they're paying for. So what are some of the global issues that come with quality management? It, we're getting into the realm now of automation and driverless cars. Well, in 2018, uh, we, we had a uh, self-driving car that ended up hitting and killing somebody. There's some argument whether or not that was a problem with the system and the quality. Uh, did, the, did the system do what it was supposed to do, or was it not a quality issue? Was it an, a, actually just bad system design because the system had never been designed to accommodate pedestrians? So. In that regard, it may not have been quality because the system was operating as it was supposed to have, have operated, but perhaps the initial requirements when they were put into the design were not well thought out in the first place. So how do we improve quality in projects? Well, the first is to, to have leadership who bought in, who believe in the idea that we need to have continuous quality improvement, that, you have, that you're rewarding quality and not punishing it, and that you're working uh, to have a higher maturity level in, in terms of overall products that you're putting out. Products and services look better when they walk out the door. Uh, and generally speaking, as companies mature, that should improve. So leadership is, is I, I know it's a cliche, 
just say it all starts at the top, but it's absolutely true. We've got people who have to, uh, to take ownership of making sure that they're putting quality initiatives. There's a company making the commitment to go to ISO 9000, for example. We may see more of these kinds of standards come into place in, in arenas outside of technology and software as well. What about education? What about medicine, for example, who are, are now getting into different kinds of quality standards? Uh, and the leadership itself says we're going to take the extra time to do things right to engender an environment where quality is important to us. So what about the, uh, the, the cost of quality? So we got what we refer to as the cost of, non, of conformance plus the cost of non-conformance. What this means, conformance, is that you have de delivered products that met spec. You were set, set on a mission to produce something, you had requirements written, and your product or service measured up to them. The cost of non-conformance means when things don't work that you accept the uh, responsibility and pay the price. That could mean the cost of non-performance, for example, is throwing out an entire batch of a product that you produced and, and absorbing the cost. By the way, that's when we get into things like management reserves uh, in terms of expense to make the customer happy and to accept responsibility for the action. So in terms of uh, cost categories that are related to, to quality, uh, prevention cost means what's it going to cost us to make sure that we are are putting quality uh, procedures in place and taking the extra time to make sure that we are are making sure our products are, are within acceptable error range or error free. What's it cost us to be able to evaluate? If we, have to, if we want to put more people on the production line, for example, to monitor quality or technologies that can do a better job of monitoring quality. Uh, if, if we are trying to detect the, the failure before the customer does, internal failure cost means what's it cost us internally to be able to, uh, to better monitor these issues. So an internal failure cost could also be considered an appraisal cost. Well, the external failure cost, if um, we ship something out to the, co the customer and then we've got to fix it, what's that costing us? And finally, measurement and test equipment costs, what does it cost us to put the right investments into buying the right products and services to measure quality? So it's been a big issue we're getting into. I know our text likes to talk about malware and, and computer viruses. I have a bad code, for example. Uh, we've, got, we've got Microsoft shipping out products regularly that are defective. Even Apple, who's got uh, a reputation for higher quality, is putting out patches to their systems on a regular basis. In addition, the more integrated our devices become, the more our privacy seems to be compromised. And again, these are, these are issues of not so much even at times quality, but how much system integration is really working well in the modern environment, how much we know about our own technologies. So in terms of, uh, of organizational influences, the bottom line really comes from management. People who, who tie in the success of the organization with quality will produce higher quality results. I'll, I'll again, use companies like BMW who have made quality one of their hallmarks. I would guarantee that the, the way that, that a manager operates in a company like BMW is akin to their manufacturing processes. Precise, ethical, uh, concerned with quality output. There's an old expression that says how a person does one thing is how a person does everything. If the inside of my car is messy, the inside of my office probably is too. If I do a sloppy job with project management, project quality management, I may do a sloppy job managing my organization as well. Something to consider. So we have different expectations of quality around the world. For example, and I'm using this as, as a stereotype, uh, in Germany, uh, with very high expectations of quality uh, as evidenced by the brands that come from there. And in less developed regions of the world, quality, for example, may not be as big of a concern. Quality of drinking water, quality of products being produced in developing countries may not be as high as those in the developed countries. We're seeing uh, countries like China, for example, who are becoming uh, major industrial powerhouses are putting greater emphasis on quality now than they did in years past. So what about maturity models? In terms of frameworks, that, that means that we are, as we go getting more mature, we are developing higher quality products. And it means that we have uh, approaches that are going to, in the long run, help us more quickly uh, increase our quality. As The more times we do something, the better we get at it, the more mature our products become and the higher quality and less defects they tend to have in them. So these are uh, CMI levels, again, right out of our text. 
So we start from uh, incomplete work our whole way up to, to optimizing. That means once you've hit optimize, you've got a mature product or service and quality measures at that point, I don't want to say are cursory, but they really are the idea of making a product the best it can be. So we move up through those levels. This comes again right from uh, from the organizational organization project management maturity model, which is part of PMI, the Project Management Institute. And again, guys, the, the idea is in the long run, quality management gets easier the longer you go because you know your product or service better, even after you've moved out of a project phase. The best practice is is to be able to to constantly improve and to make sure that your internal project managers, the people who are controlling your products or services within your organization, also have committed to these kinds of standards. How can software help us? Well, by, by tracking deliverables, by tracking uh, if we're actually getting customer sign-offs sign and, and giving us charts that show us, for example, how many defects per million we're, we're getting, whether you're using uh, software packages that produce things like uh, Pareto diagrams or, or even getting into more detailed levels of Six Sigma there are software packages that can help you do all those things. And again, to, to consider this in, a, in an agile or adaptive environment, uh, what we're, we're talking about there is that in terms, I don't want to sound biased, but it really is the idea of we're operating on a, a smaller and more frequent scale. I think that a lot of the defects that we're seeing in products right now, such as uh, operating systems, such as uh, new pieces of technology, we've come to accept more quality issues, one, based on the complexity of these systems, and two, based on the fact that they're being developed so quickly and in very competitive environments, meaning that a lot of technology manufacturers have to accept that they're going to be fixing products after they're out in the field, and that is one of the pitfalls of the Agile or Adaptive uh, methodology. So our summary is that quality is a, a constant concern and a bigger challenge in a technology environment, especially in rapid change environments like we're in right now. Uh, when you're getting into standards such as Six Sigma, they have very specific requirements, and your organization may already have committed to a particular approach. Software can help, but the bottom line is quality starts with people. I know that's management cliche, but it's absolutely true. Folks, thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day.